Hey everyone, it's Jonathan, and welcome to kind of a surprise episode of Every Version Ever. In our most recent episode with Nikki from Trivial Theater, we talked about the 2010 Cinematronic version of Alice in Wonderland, or the MS Paint version, which was made using a 1948 radio play starring Dinah Shore. That conversation reminded me that my cousins and I actually reviewed that radio play years ago. Sarah, Shana, and I were on our way to view the 2017 eclipse, and during the drive from Iowa to Missouri to Kansas, we listened to this radio play and reviewed it from the road. So since we just talked about the butchered version of that play, I thought it would be fun to go back and dig out that original road trip review talking about the actual play. I wasn't originally even considering this old episode of Wonderland Wednesday as one that I should potentially re-release for the podcast, but even though that last episode was kind of terrible, it did make me nostalgic for this old review, so I thought it'd be fun to share it with all of you as well. And then I remembered that we'd actually done two road trip reviews. Sarah and I reviewed a second radio play in 2018, actually two of them, so I thought it would be fun to include that episode as well. But, of course, let's first start with the one that started it all, sort of. 1948 radio play starring Dinah Shore. When you walk a little faster, said a whiting to a snail, there's a porpoise close behind us, and he's trailing on my tail. Welcome back to Wonderland Wednesday. Today is going to be really different. We decided to film one on the road. We were traveling to go see the eclipse today, and while we drove the way, on the way to the eclipse, we listened to a radio program from 1948. And this was an adaptation of Alice in Wonderland, of course. And we thought we'd just film a little video while we drove make something a little inter a little different, a little more interesting. It was his idea, but I'm okay with it. I like it when my videos don't all look the same, and this one, this is a way to make it look really different. And besides, it's different. It's a radio program. This is the setting we listen to it in, and yeah. uh, we can't show you a lot of visuals, I don't think. No, yeah, there's not going to be any visuals because there was nothing to watch. It was all audio. Maybe a little picture of Dinah Shore. Yeah, I'll put a picture of Dinosaur here. <laughs> um, anyways, I liked it, but what did you think? I think it was pretty good, especially compared to what we just watched. Um, sorry. Uh, it was definitely 1940s. It was kind of making me want to listen to more old, I don't know, maybe listen to more old broadcasts, but I just tend to love the old sound. Mm -hmm. I liked it just for that factor. I didn't. Right. There was some things they took some liberties on. Yeah, the they story, did take but. liberties, but they, they generally take liberties. You could tell different places where they had abbreviated the story, but they did a, I think, a fairly good job catching the flavor of it and catching different highlights pretty well. They were probably trying to fit it into an hour program, but still communicate the story decently. So. I think they did a pretty good abridged version. Yeah. But there's this announcer who comes on, probably using a mid-Atlantic accent. Google it, people. <laughs> and I, I maybe need to learn how to do that because I'm very proficient in that fake American accent. It's kind of fun and definitely of the period. And then when you transition into the Alice in Wonderland bit, <laughs> You're struck by just how deep and womanly Alice's <laughs> voice is. Yes. Because it's Dinah Shore, it's not a little girl. They weren't being correct in that, but she did a good job. And her sister didn't exactly sound like a nine-year-old either. No. Um, but one of the fun things is you get a feel for radio storytelling of the time. So that in itself is interesting and worth checking it out if, if you want to know more about that period or get a better feel for that period you just enjoy it. I expected, like we started listening to this and okay, Dinah Shore is doing the voice. I, we were 
maybe there would be more music. I personally thought maybe there would be more than there mm -hmm. was, but she Did does, she sing at all? She did, You Were Old Father William, oh, but yeah. it really wasn't like a big musical number. No. And that was okay. They had different musical elements. I just expected more, but uh, but it might have been hard on the time if they had done more singing, like trying to fit the whole story in. Mm -hmm. And she, it was only an hour, so she herself did a good job with her part, even though she didn't sound like a child. Which I'm glad that she didn't get on there and try and act all cutesy and childish when she has this probably a contralto, low range voice. It, mm -hmm. it could have been annoying and she just kept it kind of soft and sweet. Yeah. One of the things that really caught us off guard is that the white rabbit is <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> it's Elmer Fudd. Yes. And it doesn't just sound like Elmer Fudd, it's the guy who played Elmer Fudd I doing an it, Elmer Fudd voice. I figured it was because I mean it's just it's it's him. It's that uh -huh. voice, and it's so that definitely of the times, and it was kind of cute. It was mm -hmm. kind of a cute take. It wasn't obnoxious. One of and my, I, I want to say one of my favorite parts when Alice was in the house and she kicked Bill out the chimney. Oh the first, yes. The first thing the <laughs> rabbit said was, "Oh, let's burn down the house." Yeah, yeah. What did he say? Oh, we're gonna have to burn down the house. <laughs> yes. I mean, it's just it was so dry. It was like, okay, this is hilarious. this is the next course of action. It, it was very cute. I, I I can probably put a clip of that in here. Oh, so Bill's coming down the chimney, is he? Well, I think I can pull my foot down a little. There he is. Now I'll kick. There goes Bill. Catch him. Well, we have to burn the house down. A voice that irritated me was the Cheshire Cat. <laughs> Same. <laughs> yes. I was not a fan of the Cheshire Cat either. He sounded high and whiny and... And... There were, uh, it wasn't as bad as the other one, but maybe an unnecessary level of cat noises thrown in. Oh, uh, yeah. Also, when he was fading, he was making cat noises, but more than one of them sounded like a vulture had swooped down to take <laughs> the Cheshire cat away, like, mm, you know, so. Do you play croquet with the queen today? Oh, I should like to, but I haven't been invited yet. <laughs> You'll see me there. Well, goodbye. <laughs> well. He's vanished. Another thing, like with the Cheshire Cat, was that it was a little bit harder to make out the line. So it wasn't yeah, just the sound of it. I couldn't understand a lot of what he said. He was, I don't know, he just and was using some sort of a weird accent that was not very intelligible. There were one or more characters whose voices were a little bit annoying besides that, but not bad. It really wasn't bad. So we're, we're not alone. We have Shana with us, so... Shana should, Shana should tell what she thought about it, too. Oh, my favorite parts are when the bottles and the foods are seen. <laughs> <laughs> that, yeah, that was a little different. They had the food and drink speak to her what, to, instead of having her read a sign that said, eat me and drink me. You remember that happened in the 1980s version. We're back. We had to take a detour, so Not we stopped time. filming for a while. We narrowly I, missed a traffic jam. Yeah, there was, I don't know what was going on, but the traffic was at a standstill. We managed to get off and escape. <laughs> we escaped. <laughs> yes. Anyway, as we were saying, uh, the drink, the, all the food and drink spoke the lines that were written on them. And that also happened in the 1980s version, which was done by the Dr. Who people. On that version, I thought it was kind of weird, but in this one, it makes total sense, and it worked. So, did you have something else you were going to say, Shayna? Not really. <laughs> Elmer Fudd's voice really tickled me, though. Doing the White Rabbit. Yes, I, I noticed you laughing quite a lot at that, <laughs> as well as the food talking. Yes. I thought Dinah Shore's voice was very beautiful. Yeah, it's not someone you would really expect for Alice, but 
it worked for this, and I it, liked her. I would imagine having Dinosaur's voice um, helped to draw viewers in, since she would have been very, very popular at the time. I would imagine. I know her name, so that was probably a draw. Okay, we're back again, just in time to film an outro. We've we've had a bunch of interruptions. We've had to stop and get our bearings straight. So. I think that's going to be all for this week. Last week I said that we were going to have the 86 version this week, but since we filmed this on our way to the eclipse, I thought this is going to be an easy one to edit. I'll just do that this week because I still got some work to do on the 86 one. I will do the 86 one for next week and I think I'm going to split it in half because I've got a rough cut of it now and it's already over 20 minutes. So. Next week and the week after will be the 86 version. <laughs> and I don't plan on delaying it again, even though it's been delayed twice now. So I guess that's all for this week. So Sarah and I will see you next week and you'll see Shayna again eventually because we've picked out one we want to watch with her and we'll get to that in probably a couple weeks from now. So we'll see you then. Bye. Bye. This program came to you from Hollywood. During our original conversation, we were talking about having just reviewed the 1986 miniseries, and Sarah also briefly mentioned having just watched a really bad version, which was the 1931 film. While those episodes hadn't been released at the time, they were actually two of the very first really long reviews that we did that I went back to at the beginning of this podcast to recut into extended episodes. If you'd like to listen to those next, I'll have them linked in the description. The 1931 one, even though it was a terrible film, to this day, that's still one of my favorite episodes with Sarah. Now, the next review Sarah and I did was on our way to view a crane migration in Nebraska in 2018. I had really enjoyed putting together the first road trip review, so I thought it'd be fun to do it again, and I actually found two plays that time. They were produced by the same company in the same year, so we decided to review them together. The Columbia Workshop, under the direction of William N. Robeson, presents Alice in Wonderland. Hey everyone, welcome back to Wonderland Wednesday. Today we're doing another road trip review because we're on our way to see a crane migration and we decided to listen to another Alice in Wonderland radio play while we went. And this one, there was actually two that we listened to because the company, I believe it was the Columbia Workshop, um, this is from 1937, and they first did Alice in Wonderland, and then they also did Through the Looking Glass. Are and they both from the same year? Yeah, both from 1937. And we decided to do them both today. We thought about, first we thought about doing two separate reviews, but I don't think we're going to have too much to say about these because they're very old recordings. I think this would be one better listened to if you're at home and it's very quiet. Because yeah. we're in the car and of course there's a lot of loud car noise from the wind in the, on the interstate and everything. In our defense, when it, I had it more than once where it was like the recording was too loud but it was still hard to make out what they were saying. You had to concentrate more. If you're not familiar with the story, that makes it even harder. So, yeah, if you're a big fan and you can devote some quiet time to actually concentrating on it, you're going to get way more out of it than I did. We were able to follow the story, at least, because we know the story. You and were able to follow it. I, I'll get to that. You will notice there's a definite difference between this and the other radio play that we listened to that was made later on. It's a different style. One of the things I think that is noticeably 30s about this recording is Alice's voice because it's the sort of perky Snow White Deanna Durbin, oh, an innocent little person, you know, sort of voice rather than no, I'm 35 and I'm playing Alice. <laughs> we yeah. I don't know how old she was. 
And because her voice was so high, I, she was the hardest to hear. The higher the voice, the harder to hear, at least for me, on the, both of these recordings. I could hear the male voices a lot easier. Still not very clearly, but I could hear them a lot easier than Alice or the mouse or the dormouse. Anybody with a high voice was really hard to hear. I've noticed that sometimes when I'm listening to singing, it seems like sometimes the higher voice is harder to understand. And it doesn't make it a bad sound. She had yeah. a very pleasant voice, but because of the quality of this recording, In the first one, the narrator sounded like a cross between a kindly grandfather and a creepy person. <laughs> Alice in Wonderland, a fairy story of the 19th century, a bit of gossamer flimsy, a fantasy for children. I had mixed feelings, yeah. and he kept... Inject, they kept injecting his voice into this story, so that was kind of, um, it added color, but it was kind of a downside to the recording. I had higher hopes for this than yeah. what it was, because I really liked the 30s, and radio theater, it could be a really interesting thing. So to have such a hard time making it out, and then have these different characters, like the narrator, and the cat was very reminiscent of... 1930s movie as well as the later radio broadcast that we listened to that it's just that he was trying way too hard to sound like a cat but the cat but cat noises that sound more sickly or angry very sickly rather than an adorable cat that you want to adopt yeah hello Jacobus yeah. would you please tell me which way I ought to go from here I don't care. Where? Well, it doesn't matter which way you go. Something that I would have appreciated would be if they had included more good quality music. They injected some music, you know, musical background and little ditties that were in the book. they were saying stuff about the music being an important part of it. They were trying to do this experimental thing where they were using music instead of sound effects and they really wanted to know what you thought about that. They were having people write to them with their comments. It was like they want it's it's like today people ask for comments on YouTube like tell me what you think but this was like write us a letter and tell us what you think. And this was about the music. They were talking specifically about yeah. the music. And it seemed to me like if that was that important to them, they should have done like a little bit better. And for a radio program, I wouldn't have necessarily minded if they had taken liberties with the music to make it more fun. Yeah. To add music where it didn't have to be, add songs that weren't actually there that were along the theme. And they didn't do that, so I, I can't give a high rating on the music part. The best things that you can say about this are that it was, is that it was relatively true to the book, and that it has some 30s charm to yeah. it, and it does capture some of the charm of the story, the original story. I think it would be a little more charming if somebody would take the time to like clean up the recording because you can you can really tell the, the reason that we had so much trouble hearing it was because of the age of the recording it the the tape that they got it from has 
very obviously been deteriorating over the years. And it really could do with some digital cleanup. It's kind of like when we watched that other play from the 20s. I was originally yeah. excited about it, but because it was so hard to see what they were doing, it just needed to be restored or something. It, it takes away from the experience. I would also like to point out, in all fairness, these were broken up into two episodes each. For Through the Looking Glass, the narrator was way better. I don't remember him sounding creepy at all. Alice probably still had that innocent quality. There were different people who did the Through the Looking Glass one. And um, it should be noted that for the first episode of Through the Looking Glass, I slept through most of it. <laughs> <laughs> I, I left off where she was, she had gone through the looking glass, and then I think I kind of woke up at Tweedledum and Tweedledee, and that was towards the end. The second episode, I did a bit better, but my brain was not completely with it, and it was also very hard to hear, probably maybe even worse than the first one. So yeah, all in all, this is not necessarily amazing and maybe worth your time if you can listen to it in a quiet place and give it a decent amount of your attention. Yeah. And if you really love Alice or you really love old radio or the 30s. Yeah. So I'm not going to say that it's an absolutely horrible version that you shouldn't listen to. I think it might be worth checking out for some people. If the condition works. Yes. Okay, well, I think that's going to be all for today's Wonderland Wednesday. Um, I think I'm probably going to be putting this up in the middle of the ones we've already recorded. Next week, I believe we're going to be reviewing PBS's Great Performances version. It's, it's sort of like a stage play, except it aired on PBS. It was an interesting one. So we'll see you next week. Bye. Tune in next week at the same time for another workshop presentation under the direction of Irving Week. This is the Columbia Broadcasting System. At the end there, we were talking about working on our review of the PBS Great Performances version of Alice in Wonderland, which we had recently recorded at the time. If you're interested and you missed it in May, I just re-released that one as an episode of the podcast, so be sure to check it out. Also, if you're only listening to this episode and you're wondering what the noise at the end of the original episode was, I had included a clip I'd recorded while we were at the crane migration. Anyway, like I said in the last episode, we do have more episodes in the works, but since I put this one together in advance, I don't know what next time will be yet. Like I said last time, Sarah and I have watched one, we just need to review it. Hopefully we'll have gotten that done by the time this one comes out. And also, like I said last time, I am planning to release a bonus episode featuring the full conversation with Nikki that became our recent miniseries, so that'll be coming soon as well. Either way, there's lots more in the works, so we'll see you next time on every version ever. Thanks for listening.